Welcome to the 2021 Earth Science Week webinar series, Water Today and for the Future. We are pleased to have four outstanding professionals that work with issues of water and human society. Today's lecture is Earth Science and the International Year of Caves and Karst. Our speaker is Dr. George Venny, who is the Executive Director of the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. All right. So welcome everyone to Earth Science Week and the International Year of Caves and Karst. I'm speaking to you uh, on behalf of two organizations, primarily the National Cave and Karst Research Institute here in the U.S., but also uh, from the uh, International Union of Speleology, which is organizing the International Year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The main goal of this presentation is to tell you about the International Year, what it is, uh, why it's important, why caves and karst are some things that we should care about, uh, to talk about some of the sciences, the earth sciences involving caves and karst with an initial focus on water, groundwater, because that's what really creates most caves and most karst areas. And then, um, uh, but then we'll also expand it beyond to other sciences uh, involved with caves and karst. So just to start off with, uh, karst is a type of landscape. It covers roughly almost 20% of the land surface of the planet. Um, there's a significant portion of it that's buried under other rocks that affects, the, affects much of the world. Uh, but that hasn't been mapped out well yet, so so that information is ava is available. So this roughly 20% is a is a fairly conservative figure. In the United States, 25% of the United States is karst or related terrain called pseudo karst that we don't have time to go into on this presentation. Uh, on behalf of NICRI, the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. Congress saw that percentage of 25%, you know, of, of the United U.S. being cursed, and they became aware of many of the issues. So they created the Institute with the following mandates, which are well, you're welcome to read, but essentially we were created to conduct, support, facilitate cave and cursed research, education, uh, management, archiving, standardization of information, and collaborations that support all of the above both nationally and to some degree internationally. So what is the International Year of Caves and Karst? It's organized by the International Union of Speleology, which goes by the acronym UIS. It uh, functions essentially as the United Nations of cave science, cave exploration countries. And our goal is to educate the general public, lawmakers, land managers, teachers, students, scientists, because many scientists really, you know, you'd think scientists wouldn't understand this stuff, but many unfortunately don't. Essentially, we're trying to teach the world about the importance and the challenges of caves and karst. Our theme for the International Year, our tagline is explore, understand, and protect. Because essentially, if you don't know what you have, if you haven't explored, you can't study it. And without the understanding gained from that study, you cannot adequately protect and manage that resource. So what's karst? Karst is a type of terrain, a landscape, as I mentioned earlier, much like mountains and beaches are certain types of landscapes, except karst is formed primarily by the dissolving away of the bedrock. The most typical places that we see karst forming is in limestone, dolomite, and marble. But in semi-arid to arid climates, we'll also see karst form in gypsum and halite, which is basically rock salt. Um, and uh, we don't see much karst form in gypsum and halite in, in wetter climates just because those rocks dissolve so easily. Typical features that we see in karst areas are caves, sinkholes, underground streams, and the world's largest springs. The photo here is from China, a dramatic karst area in China, and the mountains that you see in the background, uh, we tend to think, well, they were each shoved up by deep tectonic forces. Well, the region as a whole was shoved upward, but the valleys in between were created by water dissolving out 
these valleys. And so we have s giant sinkholes around these, you know, uh, separating each of these cones that you see here, each of these towers. And then the water sinks is, is a river. Uh, the valley that you see in front of me, in, uh, where I took this photo, is actually a cave that's mostly collapsed. There's a bridge, a little remnant of that cave, and the water currently sinks into a cave entrance uh, underneath where I'm standing that's about 140, 150 meters tall. So how do karst aquifers form? First of all, let me define the word aquifer in case uh, you're not familiar with the term. Quite simply, it's an underground reservoir of water. Uh, in many cases, it's stored in poor spaces uh, between grains of sand and silt and gravel, uh, in other places in cracks. Um, and, uh, and in karst, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. So karst aquifers form by fractures, capturing water as, uh, as it you know, comes in from the surface and it moves on downward. And those fractures get enlarged into conduits. A conduit, hydrologically speaking, is anything larger than your pinky finger, about, about a quarter of an inch in diameter, because hydrologically, in terms of the ability of the, of the water, uh, the way it moves, the chemistry of it, its ability to, to transport sediments, and, and I should say not filter contaminants, because Karst is notorious for not filtering water, a hole this size functions the same way as a cave does. Well, as these conduits grow, they are more efficient paths for the water to flow. And so they capture water from other fractures. Instead of water fighting its way downward, it now moves into these conduits. And with more water, they enlarge at an ever-increasing rate. And when the conduit becomes large enough for a person to enter, we call it a cave. So a, ca so a cave is simply a humanly accessible conduit. How do karst aquifers work? We're all familiar probably with the uh, hydrologic cycle. Rain falls from the sky, goes down to the ground. Some, some goes back up as evaporation. Some is transpired from plants. But then it enters the ground through various mechanisms. Um, some water will move into the bedrock itself through microscopic pore spaces and struggle its way down over thousands of years uh, downward toward the water table. Some will move down the long fractures, uh, moving a little bit faster, but you know the water and fractures may be there of years, various you know, centuries perhaps. Some of the water will drip into caves and create what we call speleothems, uh, um, stalactites, stalagmites, and the like. Some water may run off of a non-karst area and then dissolve its way downward and move its way down toward the karst aquifer. Some of the fractures will dissolve and get larger and larger, forming these bowl-shaped depressions that we call sinkholes and transmit water downward. And some sinkholes are formed by collapse, where they collapse into an underlying cavity, but they can also re you know, relay that water straight down to the water table. So what happens is above the water table, most of the water moves vertically, trying to get down to the water table as fast as possible. The water table is shown by this dotted line here. It's the zone below which all cracks, crevices, pore spaces, caves, conduits are completely filled with water. Above the water table, you might have water in there part of the time, uh, or at least partially filling those, uh, those voids, but below it's completely filled. The water then moves primarily horizontally off to a valley and, uh, and then spills out as a spring. But karst aquifers evolve over time. So up here we see an abandoned high-level passage. Originally the water went in here and spilled out as a spring in this location, but then the valley cut down deeper, so it's now spilling out at this location. In some places the water may go even deeper still and be trapped below a confining unit where the water cannot move through that unit, but they'll find a fracture, in this case a fault, and rise up along that fault as an artesian spring, trying to reach that water table. With time, the valley will dissolve or will, will, will cut its way deeper. This passage here will be abandoned, and this route here will be the new, uh, the new path for, for water to flow. So these are qu quite complicated systems. Um, People ask me, for example, how old is the water in karst? 
Uh, I've stood in cave streams where the water rushing around my waist may be only a few minutes or a few hours or days old. Meanwhile, the water dripping on my head may be tens of thousands of years old. And so the flow paths, the chemistry, all of these things are quite complicated. Uh, and even these so-called abandoned upper level passages, during times of flood, the water may rise high enough and spill in this direction. Uh, and while the, the graphic here shows it going to the same valley, it could actually go to someplace completely different. And we'll talk about that right here in the next slide. As a result, karst aquifers are the most complex groundwater systems in the world. And so this just shows an example of water coming down through a system uh, into, into a karst aquifer. You can get a more 3D view of what these systems look like. Uh, if water levels rise, it may jump up over and go in a different direction. Some will come out of a cave spring. Some will go back up into, uh, into a well and be taken up into a, into a home or a community for their, for their drinking water supply. Karst aquifers are also the easiest to pollute. Um, uh, this photo here, I took this back in 1983. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is a highly polluted cave stream. Um, the black stuff you see that the water's flowing over uh, coming into this lower stream from an upper passage to a lower stuff, we tested this black material and it was sewage. It was oils and grease. It tested positive for 14 carcinogenic chemicals in excess of drinking water standards. The equipment my friend is, is carrying here uh, would test the air. And you know, based on air quality, we would determine if it was safe to continue on or if we need to go out and get the spacesuits to continue exploring and studying this cave. The fact that my friend is standing in the aquifer and not getting filtered out, uh, tells you how vulnerable this is. If we're not getting filtered out as we walk through this thing, oils, grease, bacteria, things much skinnier than we are, are also not getting filtered out. Karst aquifers are also the most easiest type of groundwater system to deplete. Uh, this photo here is an example of a, of, of a cave uh, in the Czech Republic. And it's a tourist cave. You can see the boats there. You can go enjoy fabulous trips up into this cave. But let's say you're above this cave and you drill down into this passage and you tap this water. It's like you've hit the mother load. You can pull out as much water as you want. Uh, as big a pump as you can pull out, as you can put down there, you can, you can keep pulling out water. And so that's what happens many times with karst aquifers. People don't think about sustainable use. They think about how much water they can draw at a particular time. So think about it this way. If you go to your bathtub and you turn on the tap full blast and you fill up the tub, then you go to the tub with a, with a big bucket and you start pulling out water. Pretty soon, even though the tap is going full blast, you're going to drain that bathtub because you're taking more water out than what goes in. And the same thing happens here. You can put in a well or a series of wells that can take more water out of this aquifer uh, than its ability to naturally re replenish. And so karst aquifers are the most easily depleted as a result because of this misunderstanding of the hydrology. Karst aquifers are also the sole or primary water supply for about 700 million people around the world. In the United States, uh, I estimated, estimated somewhere over 40 million people in the US. So I said I'm going to start talking about other sciences as well. Um, and, uh, and some of them correct, connect directly to the hydrology and others less so. But, uh, but we'll start with biology. This uh, photo and map is from some work of a student of mine who looked at these isopods, these surlanded isopods, this is what may be uh, a half inch long, um, and it lives in the aquifer here in Texas, and there's a map that shows you. The distance from this area here, our far as western sampling point to our eastern sampling point, San Antonio, Austin are over here in this area. It's about a 400 mile, a 600 kilometer distance. Morphologically, based on shape and other characteristics, there's no difference 
between the isopods to the east with the isopods to the west. But we know genetically there's got to be a difference. And so her project was to look at these differences. And in fact, we saw that we can segregate out the aquifer into different sections into areas that were connected but are now disconnected from the aquifer, other sections that are disconnected from, from each other, uh, even though they're right next to each other, just because we're seeing that the genetics do not allow that gene flow to occur, that do not allow those species to cross from one area to another. So this is giving us great insights in terms of how these aquifers currently function and how they also evolved uh, in the past. When it comes to mineralogy, people think of stalactites and stalagmites, your typical dripstones in caves. You know, we've got stalactites coming down, stalagmites here. These are a type of stalagmite, uh, stalactite, I should say, formed by uh, uh, called soda straws, uh, where stalactites and stalagmites join. Uh, they form columns. Uh, there's many other forms that, that occur, and those are those common things. But 24 years ago, a book came out. Uh, called Cave Minerals of the World, the second edition. And in this book, they documented over 450 different minerals that occur in caves. What you're seeing here on the right, your typical speleothems are calcite, just one mineral, but there's over four, 250 uh, that that occur in, in caves. Some of them are unique to caves or predominantly known in caves. So there's a lot to learn about the minerals and earth history uh, from what's to be found underground in our cave systems. Geomicrobiology. Uh, we talk about caves formed by water, but we're learning that microbes are also important to the process. Uh, this is a scanning electron microscope image uh, of a type of microbe that is just loosely called beads on a string for the obvious reason of what it looks like. Uh, so we're learning that microbes are critically important in terms of caves uh, and how they form. Um, and, uh, and so uh, there's just new, new information being developed, uh, potentially new, me uh, new medicines, uh, potentially industrial products uh, that might be coming out of caves and cars from these uh, unique organisms that live in these underground and often called extreme environments. They're also found important to the deposition of certain types of cave minerals. So it's not just creating the caves, but they're important to how some of the minerals in caves are formed and where they occur. Scientists around the world who study past climates are beginning to recognize, they're beginning to acknowledge that caves are the richest source of paleoclimate and paleo environmental records. Now, typically they'll study uh, speleothems, the stalactites, the stalagmites that I mentioned earlier. Here's a unique study that we at NICRI uh, uh, were involved with that, uh, a few years ago, and, uh, and I'm down here in the corner. I'll be going back, uh, it looks like in January, to continue work on this project. This is Bracken Cave. It has the world's largest population of bats. Now we're in the cave in the winter time when the bats have all flown south to Mexico. Um, but there's about 16, 15 to 16 million bats that live in the cave and the floor is nothing but bat guano. So we're doing geophysical studies to determine where the guano is deepest so we can core the guano and figure out uh, and, and capture a lot of information on the paleoecology, the paleoenvironment of the region. And so caves will give you this tr tremendously diverse information uh, from the bat guano itself to the crystal deposits, the speleothems, which can tell you about oxygen level or uh, uh, temperature, humidity levels uh, that occur in, in the past to pollens and spores, you know, that tell us what was going on specifically, who was living in the area uh, in, in this particular location. Uh, there's been cr incredibly valuable, important work done coring uh, the ice caps in Greenland and uh, down in Antarctica and coring uh, some deep sea core sediments. But that tells you specifically what's happening at the poles in the middle of the ocean. Whereas a cave will tell you what happened specifically in your backyard. And so if we develop a rich enough 
record of paleoclimatic information from the continent through caves, we can develop far richer and far more accurate climate models. If you're interested in engineering topics, sinkhole collapse is, uh, is a huge problem in this country. Uh, I mentioned earlier two types of sinkholes. They're the good sinkholes, the, one that's the ones that slowly dissolve open and are formed to put water into our groundwater supplies, into our aquifers. But then there's the bad sinkholes, the ones that collapse and cause all sorts of havoc. There was a study done by the US Geological Survey in 2015, and they found that over $300 million a year in, in sinkhole damage occur just in roads, just in highway roads. This is a minimal number because not all states reported sinkhole damage. They would just kind of lump it in with general maintenance of roads. It doesn't include city streets. It doesn't include county roads. This is highway, state highway records. It also doesn't include the damage that occurs uh, from uh, to homes, property loss, you know, that's uh, from uh, uh, from the homes going down these, you know, these sinkholes with whatever property was in there. The sinkhole on the right swallowed, I think, five or six cars when that then when that formed in the middle of a you know, in the middle of a road. Uh, the sinkhole on the left, as I recall, swallowed a couple of Porsches because it owned, uh, opened partly under a car dealership. Uh, swallowed a swimming pool. Uh, so if we really think about all of the property damage and the much broader uh, array of road damage beyond just highway, state highway damage, I feel safe to say that we're probably easily looking at over a billion dollars a year. But most people are not aware of it because it's scattered over time and space. A sinkhole opens up in your neighborhood. Uh, and the city comes out and fixes it for $5,000. It doesn't even make the news. It opens up across the country somewhere else, maybe twenty dollars or $50,000 to fix this. You know, another one someplace sells 100000 but it didn't cause any major disruptions. Um, and so, you know, there's so much damage that occurs, but it's scattered. It doesn't make the news. Most people are not aware of it, but it's a huge, a huge hidden problem, quiet crisis that uh, people need to know about. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done to better understand the engineering on how to predict and prevent these things from occurring again. Economic geology. Most people don't think about this when it comes to caves and karst, but there's a, there's a type of karst called paleokarst. And quite simply, it's where you take a karst landscape and over geologic time, you shove it deep into the subsurface. And then over that time, various mineral deposits accumulate in those caves and pore spaces and in large fractures. The primary benefit that we see is oil. If you look at the pink areas on this rock, you see it says carbonate oil provinces. And there you go, the Persian Gulf, you know, one of the major oil producing regions of the world. Uh, the Permian Basin of West Texas and Southeast New Mexico, Venezuela, another major oil producer, the North Sea. You know, there's many spots around the world, Libya, uh, that are major globally recognized oil producers and they're pumping out of paleo karst. So if we understand modern karst better, then we can better understand paleo karst in terms of its use. And I'm the first one to admit that we do need to transition away from fossil fuels. But as long as we're using them, you know, using these products, uh, it's good to be able to use them far more efficiently. There are other economic resources, uh, bauxite for aluminum, lead, zinc, copper, phosphates, plus 24 other uh, economic resources that are produced in paleokarst. But the main economic resource that we get from karst is right in front of us and it's something that often goes unrecognized and that's water. I've been involved with so many projects where people talk about economic impacts and they look at all sorts of things, but they don't look at water, they just take it for granted. And so it's not just a matter of, of clean water, but also sufficient water for our use. So I encourage everyone as you do your economic planning to keep water in the equation for your efforts. So uh, remote sensing, uh, for those of you not familiar with the topic, it re re refers to generally aerial photography uh, or some other uh, 
imaging of the land surface in the traditional sense uh, from, from a distance. The image you see here uh, is called INSAR. It's from satellite data, and what happens is a satellite sweeps over this area and makes super precise elevation measurements of the land surface. Then it sweeps over again and again and again, and, uh, and it measures the differences in, um, uh, in elevation. And so this chart here, this, this graph, because you, it's hard to see some of these cross-section lines, but it shows that the land surface over a broad area here has dropped about 40 millimeters, which is just shy of two inches. Uh, and this is over a fairly broad distance. You can see that these are in meters. So this is probably about 400 meters across, something like that. You, you're not going to notice two inches, you know, walking around the surface uh, over a 400 meter distance. Uh, but the INSAR is picking it up and it's helping identify areas where collapse may be developing, but it's not visually apparent to us. But there's other forms of... Uh, of remote sensing that we're doing in caves. We're using LIDAR, laser, laser technology, but also photogrammetry. Uh, so if you're a student and you say, well, I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands to invest in INSAR data or LIDAR data, you can take your camera, such as my friend down here, he's got his camera down in this cave, and within about 10, 15 minutes, he took photos, multiple photos of this cave wall, put in the software, some of which is free on the internet, and he developed this 3D map of the cave, which is telling us a lot of information about how this cave formed. So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, new technology and techniques that are being developed and are accessible to just about anyone. If, uh, you know, just take your cell phone and, and go start taking pictures and use, use that photogrammet photogrammetric software. Now, Taking remote sensing to its uh, to its extreme, caves and karst are involved with planetary geology. We know of about, if I remember correctly, about 300 cave entrances on the moon and about 1,400 cave entrances here on Mars. These are all images uh, from Mars. These entrances are on average about 100 meters about the football field in diameter. Uh, of course, no one's been down these things yet, but NASA uh, is looking at these things for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, they're looking for habitat. The question of the search for life is where, where are you going to find it? What will it look like? Surface conditions on Mars are brutal. Uh, radiation uh, from, uh, you, know, you know, coming from space, just penetrates that thin atmosphere, uh, the temperature variations, the dust storms, it's just brutal conditions. So if life occur occurs on Mars, or if it did occur and it's preserved somewhere, where are you most likely to find it? Most likely in a moist, sheltered, protected environment, which sounds a heck of a lot like a cave to me. Uh, and so NASA is supporting scientists to look at caves on Earth to see where and how life has adapted underground and use that as an analog to better understand where and how to look for life on Mars. But additionally, we're looking for human habitats because eventually we're going there, we're going to Mars. And it's just not feasible to carry tons of concrete and tons of metal up there to build habitat, you know, structures for us. So the first settlements uh, on the moon, on Mars, are being proposed and discussed as being underground to go down into these caves and take advantage of the natural protection that they will provide. And then with time, um, then using native materials from the planet, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, to build structures uh, on the surface uh, as needed. So if you're interested in the stars and space and other planets, you know, caves have a, have a great place for you as well. So just to close out, if you want to learn more, um, contact NICRI. Um, our website is shown here. It's been down in the lower 
right corner here all, all along. We've got a lot of information about what caves and karst are, uh, some of their benefits and challenges that I've been describing during this presentation. And so you're welcome to contact us uh, at any time. Uh, for, uh, for any technical folks out there uh, who are listening and are not on our email list, uh, we send about two messages a month uh, with news announcements, conferences, uh, grants, job opportunities. And these are not just our announcements, uh, but from around the world, because our list goes out to thousands of people internationally, and they share their announcements with us as well. You're also welcome to go to the Karst Information Portal. This is a project that NICRI uh, is doing with the International Union of Speleology, the University of South Florida, and the University of New Mexico. It is an online free library of cave and karst information. Go to karstportal.org, go to the search bar, type in your search word, and a bunch of publications and material will come up that's freely accessible for use. Of course, the International Year of Caves and Karst website, uh, iyck2021.org. Uh, it also has a lot of great information on caves and karst. Um, if you want to become a partner if, you know, in the International Year, send us your website address and the logo and we'll post it. Just this morning, we got our 244th uh, partner organization. We've held over Let's see, I've lost count, but we're somewhere well into over 300 uh, events uh, celebrating the International Year so far. And if you're interested in organizing events, they do not need to be big international affairs. Um, you know, small caving groups have taken a rope, throw it up into, into a tree in a city park, of course, with city permission, <laughs> uh, and invited the public to come and, uh, and learn how to climb ropes, how to repel, and get information about caves and cars. There have been many other opportunities. The International Year website, uh, if you look at the events page, and uh, you'll see the event results, the ones that have already happened, you'll see the largest library, video library, of lectures and information anywhere. Uh, based on all the events that have happened this year. So it's a great place to go and get yourself educated and watch many of these excellent events that we've had. So in short, I invite you to join us uh, for the International Year in whatever way you can, even if it's just telling your family and friends, hey, caves, caves and cars, they're cool places. They're important. They need protection. So um, uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, George. That was a great talk. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open the floor for questions now. I'll go ahead and get us started with a question. Uh, you mentioned karst aquifers are easy to pollute and require greater protection from pollution compared to non-karst aquifers. So yes. what are some of the ways to mitigate pollution input into these systems? Um, most, the, 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 the most effective way by far, and this may sound quite radical, uh, is stay off the karst. Now, being, being realistic, that's not always an option. Uh, and so what you can do is minimize the density of the development that you have uh, over your karst area. You can minimize um, or prohibit uh, the use of certain especially toxic materials. Uh, over your karst areas. Again, that's not always possible. Uh, pretty much the entire state of Florida is karst. You know, there's a small exception. Um, and we can't tell people, all right, everyone has to move out of Florida. Um, uh, and and so, uh, so in those cases, you know, where you have extensive, ex you know, areas, karst areas, then go the extra mile in terms of protecting your water supply. Think about it like what you do when you get into your car. You put on your seatbelt. You do that because you know that that car could kill you. And in fact, because it can kill you, you don't want just that seatbelt. You want that airbag to be working too. You want that extra measure because the consequences can be severe. So those are some of the things that can be done. Now I've heard arguments from folks saying, well, it's too expensive to have low density housing. No one will, will, will pay for that. Well, they're wrong. Um, there's a great example uh, uh, in, uh, in Texas, uh, north of Austin, a community called Sun City, 
the developers came to town rather than argue about the, re the regulations. They said, okay, what's going on? What's required? Fine. Uh, they did all the studies and they found that there were certain areas that were more vulnerable than others. They set that aside essentially as parkland. They clustered the homes low density in certain areas and, um, and people are paying a premium to live there because they've got this beautiful parkland as their backyard. Um, so it, 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 can, it can be done. Additionally, speaking of Texas, and I can speak a lot about Texas, you know, it's, it's, I live in New Mexico where the Institute is based, but I think of Texas still as home. Uh, San Antonio and Austin, those cities have both taxed themselves. The citizens voted and taxed themselves multiple times to raise money and buy sensitive karst land to protect the water supply and to protect uh, uh, their ecosystems. So uh, uh, now in those cases, you know, you know, they have non-karst areas that they can also build with. You know, so it's not like, again, it's not a Florida type situation. But those are some of the things that can be done. Okay, that was great. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions here. Um, what type of geophysical equipment was used to map Guyano, if I pronounce that right? To map the guano in, the, in, uh, in Bracken Cave. Um, the, uh, uh, we used electrical resistivity. There are many different types of geophysical equipment. Um, what's most familiar to the public is ground penetrating radar because everyone has a pretty good sense. Yeah, radar, I get that. But that's not the most appropriate tool for many karst investigations. It is for some, but not for others. Likewise, resistivity is not always the most, uh, most appropriate tool. It really depends on the geology and other circumstances of what you're looking for um, and uh, you know, what interference may occur in your, in your situation. Uh, in my experience, um, the best tools I've found for studying caves have been resistivity combined with microgravity because where one technique is weak, the other is strong, and so they complement each other very well. And so if I get a positive hit on both, then I know I have high confidence that, yes, there's something real down there. So that's, but that, that's what we use. We use resistivity, uh, sending electrical current into the ground uh, uh, at, uh, at Bracken Cave. All right. Thank you, Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another question. Have you used any electrical resistivity tomography for mapping karst environments and with how much success? Um, well, yeah, yeah, that's just the question I answered and, and, uh, and with great success. Um, and uh, we've, uh, uh, personally, I've been involved with it uh, in around the country in many locations. It is one of the most commonly used methods um, uh, to do karst geophysical investigations. Here in New Mexico, we've used it in many different uh, settings. So, um, so yes, a, a resounding yes for uh, electroresistivity. Thanks for that, George. And I'm actually just curious, George, if you know what's the age of some of the oldest caves on Earth uh, today that we know of? The, the oldest cave that we know of uh, uh, is the Janolan Cave System in uh, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, and if I remember correctly, then this is based on sediment preserved in that cave. Um, uh, the cave formed about 370 million years ago. Most caves are much younger than that. Um, they, um, you know, they're at the they're at the land surface. The surface erodes away, and the cave erodes with it uh, over several million years. Um, the case in Australia is that uh, tectonic processes took that cave, buried it, uh, and then re-exhumed that cave. So you know, so it's so it's been so it was preserved and 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 brought up again. Uh, but typically, most caves are I would I would estimate are within 20 million years of age, 20 to 50 at the tops, but most of them are probably 20 million years old or younger. Okay, that was great, thank you. Um, another question here, how would one attempt to fix a sinkhole? There's, there's different ways of repairing sinkholes. Um, in many situations, it, and it depends on 
on the origin and depth of the sinkhole. Let, let me back up for a moment because I didn't go into the details of this uh, during my presentation, but I'll explain a little bit more for this question. There's two basic types of collapse sinkholes. One is a bedrock collapse where a roof of a cave falls in. And that's what most people have in their mind of what one of these sinkhole collapses is. But that's actually pretty rare to happen on the landscape. Most of the sinkhole collapses that we hear about that are in the news are soil collapses, where you have at least 10 meters, about 30 feet or more of soil that covers the bedrock. And then water in the area moves through that soil, washes the soil out, into, into holes in the bedrock that gets washed away once it gets into the karst aquifer, and a soil cave occurs over the bedrock. And so soil is far less stable, far less structurally strong than rock, and so it's the soil that usually collapses. So if you're dealing with one of these soil collapses, or what we call a cover collapse sinkhole, um, if the soil is only about 30 feet deep, uh, the best thing to do is to dig on down to the bedrock, find the drain, um, find the drain. And sometimes you have these enormous sinkholes that form from a hole that's only about a fist in diameter. So find the drain and then you do what's called a graded backfill. You take large rocks and you put them on the bottom of the sinkhole over that drain. And then as you, as you continue to fill that sinkhole, you progressively use smaller and smaller and smaller rocks, finally pea gravel, finally, you know, sand and, and soil on, on top. And the reason for this gradual progression is it allows the water to move through, but the sediment doesn't move through. And so therefore you don't have another uh, collapse. Typically what happens with many sinkholes is people then just back up with a, with a dump truck full of dirt and rock. Uh, and then that dirt and rock just starts you know, sliding and washing on down those things, uh, down, down those cavities and creates an, another sinkhole. So that's the most common and oftentimes the best way to do it. I will say that the best method, of course, is prevention. A few years ago, uh, uh, some colleagues and I, uh, with, with working with me, my co colleagues in, in Tampa, Florida, um, we wrote a paper proposing a way to avoid sinkholes, and we found that sinkholes form about ele with 11 times greater frequency in urban areas because of the way water is managed on the surface. And so poor water management uh, will exacerbate and cause uh, sinkholes to form far more rapidly uh, than, than they do in, in, uh, in other areas. So uh, if, anyone, if anyone is interested, they can contact me. I'll be glad to provide them a copy of that paper, which gives general guidelines for how to avoid such problems. All right, thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Another question asks, how about tectonic caves? How important are these? I don't know if you can speak to those a little bit. Sure, um, the term tectonic cave um, properly you know, refers to um, caves that formed by rock movement. Um, usually these caves are fairly limited in extent. They will occur, for example, along a steep valley where uh, the rock just cracks off from the main body of the rock and kind of slumps down, down toward the valley. Uh, there's, uh, there are other tectonic caves that are uh, much larger and more significant uh, than that. Um, these caves are geologically quite young. They tend not to be uh, uh, as in, you know, they, they tend not to be important water supplies. Um, they're uh, uh, biologically, they, they need more study. Most of them, again, are fairly young and won't usually have cave adapted fauna, but some will. Um, so for example, in, uh, in West Texas, uh, Texas only has one endangered species of bat and it occurs in a cave uh, in, uh, in West Texas, that's a tectonic cave. Uh, um, and so it provides habitat uh, for, the, for this important uh, bat species. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, some tectonic caves may be important culturally uh, because, you know, if the caves are a few thousand years old and fairly stable, then uh, that's certainly long enough uh, for humans to have spent some time uh, in those caves using them for shelters or, or other resources. Thanks for that, George. 
we have another question. Um, have you ever had the opportunity to research the cave of crystals? I so haven't. You, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the, what's, what the person's asking about um, is down in Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, a region known as Nica. Uh, and the cave uh, in Spanish, Cueva de los, de los Cristales, the Cave of Crystals. Uh, it's an incredible cave. Uh, it was found uh, by mining uh, the mountain in that area and putting in these enormous pumps that are drawing down the water table so that the miners can go deeper and deeper. Um, so I haven't been there, uh, but one of my colleagues from NICRI uh, has done some work, Dr. Penny Boston, who is now with NASA. She's the director of astrobiology with NASA. Uh, but while she was with NICRI, she went there and did uh, the microbiological studies uh, of these caves. Um, and uh, people have asked if, these ca if, if this cave uh, will, be, uh, will be accessible in the future, and that's highly unlikely. Uh, my understanding is the mining company spends about $2 million a year in electricity alone to keep pumping the water, to keep the water table that low um, and uh, in order to access uh, this cave uh, or, to, or to access this area for mining. And so uh, uh, so there's no way the cave will, will bring that much money to, to keep the mining, uh, the, to keep that pumping operation going. Uh, but while uh, while it is accessible, if you happen to find yourself in, uh, in the state of Chihuahua, I'd certainly encourage you to get over there. I'd love to do it myself, just haven't found the time yet. And, and I, w I will point out a, a very important consideration. The cave is amazingly hot. Um, you know, they, they don't allow people really to go into the cave right now. You go into a little ante room between the mine wall and the cave wall. Uh, and so they've hollowed out a little spot there. Um, and the cave is like uh, 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's amazingly hot, and you don't survive very long uh, at those temperatures. The the people, the scientists who've explored and surveyed the cave and studied it, were wearing special cooling uh, suits uh, to keep them cool. But generally, they didn't spend more than 20 or 30 minutes in there before they'd start overheating. Um, and the little ante room that you go into is not as hot as the cave itself, but you will be sweating up a storm while you're there. Thanks for that, George. Yeah. We have a lot of questions coming in, so that's great. Um, the next one, uh, can you talk a little bit about what are some best uh, current low-cost methods to identify or map karst aquifer vulnerability to assist use uh, to assist land use decision makers? The, the challenge in mapping vulnerability, uh, and I always hesitate, I've done vulnerability mapping, and I, and I hesitate doing it because inevitably what I've seen happen time and time again is that you have a map and it says this is an area of higher vulnerability and this is an area of lower vulnerability. And many people will then say lower vulnerability means not vulnerable for practical purposes. And so they treat it as if it's not vulnerable. The way karst works is if you're on karst, it's vulnerable, period. Uh, when we say higher and lower vulnerability, we're just splitting hairs between the super hypercritical vulnerable areas versus the super critical vulnerable areas. There's not the hyper part in there. Um, so, uh, so I strongly encourage people to, to, to treat the karst, all of the karst, uh, as carefully, as cautiously uh, as possible. Um, that, and, and, and just bear with me. Let me give you uh, an example. Um, before I, the last uh, dye trace I did before coming to Nickery, uh, and a dye trace is where you take a non-toxic dye and you inject it into the ground and see where it shows up and how long it takes to get there. Um, and this was a dye trace I did in Texas, just north of San Antonio, um, and uh, went to an area, flat ground, no cave, no obvious curse feature, which is one of the things people look for in vulnerability mapping. Uh, is there a sinkhole and a large fracture, something there? Didn't see anything. Um, so we dug into the soil about four inches, about 10 centimeters. <clears throat> and it was about one square meter in size. So one square meter, 10 centimeters deep. I think 
I calculated that it, it would have, that hole in the soil would hold maybe about 20 gallons, 25 gallons of water, something like that. And we only dug that because we took a hose uh, from a nearby spigot and ran it over there, and we wanted the water to stay in one place. And so that's the only reason we, we dug into the soil. And so we ran that hose at a rate of two liters per, uh, uh, was it two liters per, per, uh, uh, per minute into that hole. And we did that for 30 days. We put in close to 29,000 gallons of water into that hole. The hole never overflowed. We put some dye in there and the dye showed up at a well three kilometers, almost two miles away. So this emphasizes that point of vulnerability mapping that it's all vulnerable. There was no evidence of anything sensitive in that location. It's a sort of location that people would put a gas station on top of. Uh, but if that gas station linked, leaked, then you can imagine what, what would have happened to that groundwater. So that said, um, there um, there's a couple of papers I've published on uh, 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 environmental impacts assessments on karst. And rather than try to give you a specific menu of how to do things, it really depends, and this is one of the things I, I recommend in there, it really depends on your karst areas. Not all karst areas uh, express themselves the same way. Some have thick soils, some have thin soils. Uh, some are epigenic, formed by water moving down to the ground. Some are hypogenic, formed by water rising up from, from, from depth. Um, so I recommend, recommend looking at something like that, but certainly at, uh, at a minimum, identify the area uh, where you have exposed karstifiable rocks, typically limestone, dolomite, or as I said earlier, uh, gypsum and halite in more arid climates. That's your first stop. Uh, identify whatever shows up on topographic maps, uh, such as sinkholes. Those are your, your hypercritical vulnerable areas. Uh, cave entrances. Cave data is sometimes hard to come by. Um, you know, a lot of the hey, cave data has been misused, and so uh, the cave organizations that collect and and uh, uh, and protect and manage the data, they're always walking a fine line between trying to make it available to protect caves and cars to support research, but then not making it available in such a way that causes harm, uh, where people can go in um, and, uh, and kill themselves because they don't know what they're doing. They don't have the proper training uh, or vandalize the caves or cause problems for the landowners. So they're always struggling you know, for, with that balance. So, uh, so look at that. A critical component in doing any environmental assessment in karst and, and, and determining vulnerability is to develop a conceptual model of how the karst formed in that area, because you will not find every karst feature. You cannot map and squeeze into every little cave passage that, that's out there, but a conceptual model will tell you how this system works in a way beyond what you can physically map and measure. So uh, though this is a fairly broad brush uh, uh, answer I'm giving you, uh, but that's just the limit of, of, of this forum that we have. And again, people are always welcome to contact me uh, for, for more information. I'd be glad to share it. Uh, I should point out also, um, because we're talking about really cave and karst management, uh, for those who are able, uh, it's short notice, but uh, the first week of November, uh, in San Marcos, Texas, just south of Austin, uh, is the National Cave and Karst Management Symposium that focuses on things like this. Um, and so if you can get there, um, it's a great, great meeting to go to. Uh, the, the symposium is held every couple of years and it travels around the country. It hasn't been in Texas since 1989. Um, so, um, so that's one to watch out for. Uh, also, NICRI uh, hosts a conference that's called the Sinkhole Conference, uh, but it's actually a much broader name. It's the Multidisciplinary Conference on Sinkholes and the Engineering and Environmental Impacts of Karst, which is why we call it the Sinkhole Conference. So it's, it deals with, uh, with uh, vulnerability mapping, groundwater protection, sinkholes, and so forth. And uh, uh, our last conference was canceled just before it was set to run because of COVID. We're now starting to make plans for the next one. I don't have an announcement yet of where that will be. Uh, but if you go to sinkholeconference.com and watch that website, that will, uh, that will pop up hopefully within the next couple of months with information. All right, great. Thanks for that. I think we have time for one more quick question. Our 
Karst formations generally all the result of ancient seafloor sediment deposition or other depositional environments as well? Um, karst karstic rocks are primarily um, various types of, of, uh, of lithified sediments. Um, limestone, dolomite, marble is a metamorphosed you know, um, limestone. Um, uh, you know, gypsum, halite, those are uh, marine sediments. You do have some caves formed in lacustrine limestone, like borne limestones. Um, but uh, but the, the, the short answer pretty much is yes. Um, but, uh, but caves will form in other types of environments. Uh, as you can see, I'm with the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, not the Karst Research Institute, because many caves form in non-karst environments. Uh, I mentioned pseudo-karst early in the presentation, and there are many important caves in pseudo-karst. Uh, Kazamura Cave in Hawaii is, you know, has the greatest vertical extent of any cave in the United States, over a thousand meters. Uh, and it's uh, a lava tube uh, on the, you know, under the flanks of the Mount Kilauea volcano. Um, and so there are many other types of caves. We mentioned tectonic caves a moment ago. Those can form in any type of uh, hard rock, not just limestone. So, um, um, so yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, but for true karstic rocks, yeah, they tend to be mostly marine rocks. Right. Thanks for that. Okay, well, that's about all the time we have for today. So thank you everyone for the excellent questions and thank you, George, for presenting today. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much, George, for sharing your time, expertise, and insights with us. And thank you everyone for joining us today.